Yeah, so um, Professor Joe told me that uh, you all were complaining that I didn't go fast enough yesterday. So um, I'll try to speed it up today. Okay. And cover more material too. Um, all right. So um, today we want to talk about, uh, how should I put it? New ways to think about very old problems, okay? So the first thing I want to tell you is about important sampling. What does that mean? So let's do a little example. Our problem is to, this we do all the time, right? We want to estimate some expectation value of some observable over a random variable x, and we have some probability distribution uh, that weights what the importance of any given value of x is, right? That's, that's the P of x. And a lot of what we talked about the first three lectures was how to determine P of x. And one of the ways we determine P of x, the probability distribution or the probability density for the random variable x is we probe it with many different uh, operators or many different observables, right? We do this all the time, calculate expectation values over some uh, probability density of the value of that observable. Now, what if this observable is only non-zero where this density is very small? So now, um, imagine that the expectation value, so when I write this symbol i, the curly, the calligraphic i, what I mean is the, uh, the function that's a one, where that uh, observable is non-zero and zero everywhere else, right? So this is shorthand for the heavy side function, okay? Now, suppose this value is less than 10 to the minus eight. In other words, the probability density of all the points where this observable is a non-zero is very, very small, right? So if we wanted to estimate the value of this observable, the expectation value, we would have to draw more than 10 to the eight samples, right? To get even one example where this observable would be non-zero, right? Yes? So it's very inefficient to do sampling in regions where this probability density is very small, right? So the whole idea of important sampling is to distort the density, to, dis to replace this P of X with something where we know how we modified it, right? but the events where x happens to be, uh, where o happens to be non-zero, get uh, a higher probability in the distorted density, okay? Yes? So let me give you an example how this works, or what concretely we mean by this. So we want to estimate this gamma. I is some function that is non-zero in some range of the density of the values that this random variable takes. Now, when we draw n samples from this density, so we're doing some sort of Monte Carlo or some sort of sampling estimation of this number gamma. Now, we draw n samples from this probability density, and our estimate is gamma n is the average one over n i, this heavy side function evaluated at x i. Yes? Right? Very simple. Now, this estimate has variance like so. Gamma times one minus gamma divided by n. Right? Also very standard. Now, suppose we want a confidence interval for our estimate of gamma, right? This is where we use the central limit theorem. We're sampling the same thing many, many times. 
And so it tells us, you know, you can look up the Z table if someone gives you, oh, I, conf I want alpha, the level of the confidence to be 0 0.01, you can look up the Z table, which is uh, tabulated uh, the area under the Gaussian for alpha over two, and our estimate would be gamma n plus or minus z, uh, you know, at alpha over two times the square root of the variance, right? Also, very, very standard, right? Yes? Um, for example, if alpha was 0 0.01, the confidence interval for gamma being less than 0.1 would be um, this number 2.576, is the square root, is that uh, z uh, that we calculated for alpha equals uh, 0 0.01, and the square root of the variance should be less than 0 0.1 times our estimate gamma n. So what's the value of n that we need? Well, n is approximately, you, um, uh, I gave you the formula for variance, right there, there's n. So we solve this for n, and we find that n needs to be, oh, about 2.576 divided by 0.1 squared times one minus gamma over gamma. That comes from the variance divided by gamma. So if gamma is very small, like gamma is 10 to the minus six, right? Then that means that we need almost seven times 10 to the eight samples to estimate this very, very small number, right? Yes? So that is the real problem of trying to estimate a quantity that's only non-zero where that event is very, very rare, okay? That's what we're trying to do. So how do we do this? Well, the basic idea is, as I said, we're going to distort P of X into another density. and are what we're going to talk about right now is how do we choose this distorting density. So imagine you, this is just algebra going from here to here. You see I multiply and I divide by some density Q of X, right? I can do that for any density Q of X that is non-zero in the range of values that X takes, I can do this, right? Um, and now the idea is that we change our observable from being the heavy side function of, uh, you know, that's non-zero only in some region. We're going to change the variable, the observable, to be p of x divided by q of x times our original um, variable. Yes? So we get, instead of e sub p, the expectation with respect to the measure p, we now are evaluating the expectation with respect to the measure Q, the density Q, of, but of a different observable, right? Very simple idea. Is that clear? What are we doing? We're just multiplying and dividing by Q, and then we're going to try to be clever in how we pick Q. Yes? That's the idea. So, sort of intuitively, we want to pick Q of X so that I, I evaluated at those values of x when i is non -zero, is equal to one is not rare in this distribution, right? That's the idea. If we sample with respect to q, this value of x where i, our original observable is not equal to zero is not rare, right? So let me, maybe I draw it and that'll be a little bit clearer. So suppose our initial distribution is like so, and we want to evaluate something way in the tail here, right? So I O is greater than zero only here, right? Okay, so that means we draw, if we draw things from where the density is high, I is zero there, right? So it's totally useless for us to estimate this, right? So what we're going to do is distort this by Q, and Q might be a density that looks more like, uh, more like 
So this was our original density P, our new density might be like this, right? And now what happens? Now the region where our observable is non-zero, right, is much more likely to occur if we sample with respect to Q, yes? And we have to compensate for the fact that we've changed the density to Q by the observable going to P over Q times the observable, right? So the samples that we need from Q are not rare anymore, right? But we're compensating for the fact that we distorted it by multiplying by this number, right? And this number can be small. In fact, it will be small, right? Because P is small in this region and Q is large, right? But the sampling that we do will give these values much more frequently, right? That's, that's really, it's a very simple idea, but it turns out to be very powerful, as I'll try to show you, okay? Yes? That's all there is to it. Okay. So now what we're going to talk about is how do we pick Q in some sort of, uh, how should I say, uh, rational way, okay? Okay, intuitively, as I tried to explain, what we want to do is we want to maximize Q of X where our observable is not equal to, is greater than zero, right? Or not equal to zero, right? Any Q will lead to the same expectation if you draw enough times, right? If you take enough samples, any Q will lead to the same expectation value, okay? What's different about different Qs? What would be different about different Qs? How would we go about picking Qs if, if I draw enough samples, the Q will always end up, I mean, the observable will, will always end up having the same expectation value with enough draws. So what rational reason do we have how do we decide what Q to use? Sorry? Right, so we want to figure out some way to quantify how quickly it's converging, okay? And the way you quantify that is to evaluate the variance of the observable, the variance of this distorted observable, right? we calculate how, what the variance of this distorted observable is, okay? And a little bit of algebra, this, I just plugged in this distorted variable in here. Remember, this is the heavy side function, so I squared is I, right? So this expectation value with respect to the uh, new density Q of OQ squared is Q times P of X over Q of X squared times IO. So that turns out to be the expectation with respect to our original density P, okay, of this distorted uh, observable, okay? So what we're calculating is the variance, right? And what we want to do is We want to minimize, we want to find Q so that this variance is minimized, right? We want to pick Q so that this variance is minimized. Yes? So that's going to be our criterion for which Q to pick. So I have some bad news, first of all. If you actually rationally try to derive what Q should you use, the answer is going to be, oh, Pick a Q that's based on this unknown density P. That's not useful, okay? So uh, it turns out to be more a matter of looking at the data and finding a Q that um, will minimize the variance, okay?
So you might pick some parameter, parameterized family of Q densities and see where you find the lowest variance. Okay? Yes? Right? Simple idea. Did we get it? Yes? We modified the observable and we modified the original density in such a way the expectation is the same, but the sampling makes it much more efficient. And then we try to figure out how we distort it by trying to make the variance of our estimate as low as possible. Okay? Yes? Okay. Will this always work? Well, no. So there's a little bit of art here in terms of how you do the important sampling. Okay? So here's a counterexample, if you like. Suppose p of x is an exponential de density, right? Exponential distribution, we covered this in lecture one, for instance. Suppose we want to estimate what's the uh, area for uh, x larger than some, some fixed y, okay? So let's try, suppose we distort with uh, another version of the, you know, some other parameter mu, but still an exponential distribution. So if I do this little calculation, what you'll see is lambda squared over mu times two lambda minus mu divided, um, so that's divided, and then this exponential. And I'm putting a factor L as the upper limit, just to make it clear that mu cannot be bigger than two lambda, okay? Lambda is unknown, but mu cannot be bigger than two lambda because otherwise this integral will diverge, right? So that's an upper limit to how much we can distort Q. I mean, how much we can distort, right? How, how we pick Q. Well, mu has to be less than two lambda. Otherwise, this, the variance is infinite, right? Okay. Similarly, mu can't go to zero, right? That's just no distortion at all. That's the uniform density, right? Or rather, it is very distorted, but it diverges again, right? So basically, there is no minimum at any finite value of mu, okay? So I said, oh, we'll try to minimize the variance, but in this parameterized family that I picked, there is no parameter at which the variance is actually minimized, okay? So that's what I mean. You still have to do some sanity checks that you picked a family where the variance is bounded, okay? So statisticians spend a lot of time um, proving when certain classes of these um, densities that we pick, right, are actually going to give you bounded variance everywhere in the distorted dense, uh, space of densities. Okay? Yes? Okay. Now let's um, apply this important sampling measure redefinition idea to actually prove Cramer's theorem. You remember way back when I stated Cramer's theorem as a consequence of the Gertner-Ellis theorem. I never proved the Gertner-Ellis theorem, right? So I just motivated why it would be. And then I cheated because I said, oh, we'll use the Gertner-Ellis to prove Cramer's theorem, okay? So I want to give you a proof of Cramer's theorem directly, okay, and using this idea of important sampling, okay, the measure redefinition. Okay. Now we're going to go through this slowly, so please don't let your eyes glaze over like what is this, too many equations, but we go through this slowly. Um, so here's the probability that the sample average, the sample mean, is greater than some value mu plus epsilon, okay? Right? So I'm going to basically redo Chebyshev's inequality in this measure distorting way. Just, just follow along. So this probability, right? I just rewrite it. I can write it as the probability that the sum of all the variables minus n times mu, so in other words, I multiplied the argument of this probability by n everywhere and I brought the mu over to the left-hand side, right? So I get it's this probability is equal to the probability of the sum of xi's 
minus n mu being bigger than n epsilon, right? Yes? Now, if you remember our first proof of, proof of Chebyshev's inequality, um, we then said, well, the probability that it's bigger than n epsilon means that if we take the expectation value divided by n squared epsilon squared, this quantity is less than this probability, right? That, does that make sense? We're looking at the probability where this quantity is greater than n epsilon, right? So the expectation of this thing squared is always in this region bigger than n epsilon, right? So if I divide by the expectation divided by n squared epsilon squared, that is less than this probability, right? But the numerator is just n squared times sigma squared. If x is a, a normal a random variable with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, the numerator is just n squared sigma squared. And the denominator is n squared, sorry, the numerator is just, uh, what did I say? The numerator is n times sigma squared because this is n copies of x minus mu, right? So the numerator is n times sigma squared. The denominator has n squared epsilon squared. So this is sigma squared over n epsilon squared, okay? Which is the sort of statement that Chebyshev's inequality said, right? That the probability that the mean is bigger than something is greater than this we stated it the opposite way, that the problem, okay? And you can do the same argument if you change the sign, you mu mi minus mu minus epsilon, same, same kind of argument. Now, if you look at this, <clears throat> the same thing, the same argument, we could just put in some arbitrary, always increasing function psi, and the same thing is true. Just think of it, psi is any non-negative increasing function, then this probability is less than or equal to probability that psi of the left-hand side is bigger than psi of the right-hand side, okay? Simply because psi is a non-negative increasing function. What examples do we know of non-negative increasing functions? that we are very fond of. Sorry? Yes, more generally, we're very fond of the derivatives of convex functions, okay? So let's just keep in mind that this psi will turn out to be the derivative of a convex function at some point, okay? All right, so that's what we get when we basically, x squared was the function that we used here, here we're taking psi to be any non-negative increasing function, and we get this, okay? Just the same argument, but the other way, okay? Now we take psi to be the exponential function, okay? And what we get, and why did I do this? Because remember, we were distorting the density, right? So this in the uh, large deviations literature is called tilting the measure, okay? Just in case, you ever read a paper on large deviations and you see this phrase tilting the measure, okay? That's what they're doing, is they're multiplying it by e to the lambda s, okay? Then the, for this choice of psi, we just evaluate this and what we get is one over n probability, this probability is less than or equal to minus lambda s uh, plus one over n sum of i log e da da da, okay? Yes? That's all we did. Uh, I may have left out a log here. I did leave out a log here, okay? There's a log between, right here there should be a log after the first one over n, okay? Then, then, then you'll see what I mean because you have psi ns in the denominator 
psi is e to the lambda s, so that's where that minus lambda s comes from. Okay, so sorry, there's a log here between the first one over n and the p. Okay, so that's how we get this. Do you recognize the cumulant generating function? Anyone? There's n copies of the cumulant generating functional right here. Log of exponential lambda x. That's the moment generating function is e to the ex expectation of e to the lambda x. Log of that is the cumulant generating function. So what we have is n separate copies. And this tells us that the left hand side is greater than or equal to supremum of lambda s minus the cumulant generating function. Hopefully that reminds you from way back in prehistory, like Monday or something, that is the Legendre transform, right? And this is what the important sampling thing is trying to get at, right? Again, there's a log missing here as well, okay? So there's a log here, there's a log here, okay? All right, uh, this is an, a lower bound, so let's do the upper, the other bound. Now, again, you see the distortion? Our new measure Q of x is P of x times e to the lambda x divided by mx lambda. Why do we put in this mx lambda? Which is just a number. It's not a random variable. It's not a function of a random variable. It's just a number. It's just a function of lambda, right? That's the moment generating function. So it's just a function of lambda, okay? Why do we put it, that in the denominator? Because then if we calculate the expectation value of one in this measure Q, it's the measure Q is still normalized, okay? Right, so this is a concrete example of where this tilting of the measure or important sampling changing, it actually is going to be used, okay? Um, so now we do that same calculation, and this time I left the log where it was supposed to be, okay? And let's not go through the algebra in great detail, but basically uh, what I want to point out is you do a little bit of the same kind of algebra, and you end up, and this is where I will go into detail, the same sort of arguments give you this. That's just taking this log and noting that this part is just this part. But then when we take the log of expectation of this part right here, the heavy side function for this, that's where we have to be a bit careful, okay? So that I'll do in detail now. So are we clear about what's going on here? We did one side of the inequality for finding the rate function as a function of lambda s minus the cumulant generating function, right? Now we're doing the other side of the inequality so that at the end we'll say, oh, that's why it's true because it's both less than and great, greater than this function, okay? So this is looking at it from both sides. In the statistics literature, actually, what they prove is that there's an upper bound for the rate function, there's a lower bound for the rate function, because that's the, the general case. You actually get an upper bound and a lower bound and they're not coincident, okay? So there's a supremum on one side and there's an infimum on the other side and that's the precise mathematical way of formulating um, Cremer's theorem, okay? or anything to do with rate functions, actually. If you look at a mathematical paper on rate functions, it'll always talk about the lower bound and the upper bound for the rate function, okay? But we're physicists and data scientists, so we don't care. All right, okay, now as I said, I'm gonna go through this carefully because this is where we see exactly where the Legendre transform comes in. So what we wanna show, we have this form, and we'd like to say that, oh, this is the only part that matters as we take the limit epsilon goes to zero, okay? That's what we'd like to argue, which means we have to point out, we have to show that this right-hand side actually goes to zero. That's not obvious, okay? 
So we have to show that this right hand side, this right, the term on the right actually, the term on the, on the right for me, on the left for you, this term actually goes to zero, okay? All right, so there's that term and we want to show the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this probability that S plus epsilon is an upper bound for the mean, sample mean, and that's greater than S goes to zero. So now let's look at some properties of the cumulant. First of all, uh, the derivative with respect to lambda uh, is, if you write it in terms of EQ, our distorted measure, it's the expectation of X in the distorted measure. And in our original measure, it's the expectation of X times E to the lambda X divided by the cumulant generating function at lambda. On the other hand, by definition almost, at lambda equals zero, the derivative is just the true mean, right? Okay, so what happens as lambda goes to infinity? What's the value of the derivative of the cumulant as lambda goes to infinity? So this is the general form. Tell me, what's gonna happen as lambda goes to infinity? Make a guess, what's gonna happen? Look, it's just a probability density, right? This expectation of a random variable. Imagine there's a probability density, right? If I distort the measure giving more and more power to the highest value of x that the measure is non-zero, that the density is non-zero, right? As lambda goes to infinity, it's just going to go to that highest value. It'll be concentrated only on that highest value, right? Okay, so that's what I mean is as lambda goes to infinity, this goes to the largest value in the support of X, right? The largest value of the support. So now if it starts at mu and goes to the maximum of the support, at any value of S between the lowest value and the maximum of the support, right? There is some value of lambda, which is a function of S, such that this cumulant generating function evaluated at that lambda of S is S plus epsilon over two. Why do I say S plus epsilon over two? Because you see what that says is that this thing in the center here is actually in the center. The probability is not zero, right? So that means this log probability goes to zero, right? because the probability is guaranteed to be one. Because I picked lambda of s so that this probability is one, log of that is zero, and that's independent of epsilon. Okay, it's a little bit subtle, but it's important to get, you know, you wanna be careful with these things, okay? Because the rate function is not just any old smooth function, right? It can have uh, places where it's actually infinite, which, what does it mean when a rate function has an infinite value? What does it mean? Can a rate function have an infinite value? Come on, I won't bite your head off, just guess. What does it mean for a rate function to have an infinite value? Sorry? The probability, the probability is a zero at that value. So the rate function had better be infinite at that value because remember it's e to the negative n rate function is the probability, right? So if the probability, if the rate function happens to be infinite, that means the probability is exactly zero that that mean value is never going to get to that value, right? Okay, um, so it's important to show this. And so what you see here now is our, the other side of the inequality, lambda of S, lambda which is now a function of S, right? 
minus k of x at lambda of x. And that is exactly the Legendre transform, right? So the rate function as a function of s is equal to the Legendre transform of the cumulant. Okay? So that's an honest proof of the Cremere theorem. Okay? Yes? Are there any questions? Because now we start to do funky stuff. Yes? No? Maybe? Yes, please. Yes. Sorry? Sorry, uh, could you explain it again? Yes. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> here's a line. And suppose P of X looks like this, right? Yes? This is the original P of X. Now, we're multiplying this by E to the lambda X, right? That was our Q of X, multiplying it by lambda of X. So for different values of lambda, this will start to look like this. Right? But it can never get higher than the point at which um, P of X, the last, the highest value where P of X is non-zero, right? So as lambda gets larger and larger, Q of X becomes more and more like this, right? So ultimately, as lambda goes to infinity, remember Q of X is normalized, its integral is one, right? Okay, so what's it going to be? The only value it can be is Q of X becomes a delta function exactly at the largest value of M, uh, of the support of P, okay? And that's what I was trying to explain, okay? That as you distort it to higher and higher values of lambda, right? The area under the Q of X curve is still one, right? But it gets more and more concentrated at the maximum end, right? Yes? So that's where that comes from. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to use this um, probability tilting in funky ways to make uh, the maximum likelihood maximization that uh, we've mentioned several times, we're trying to make it um, basically trivial, okay, or very easy to do. So, um, take a little detour to explain the motivation for what we're going to do. So, suppose you have a single spin, right, and it takes values plus one, minus one, right, that's it. So, we can form a partition sum we have uh, certain probabilities that the uh, value plus one is taken, certain value probability that the value minus one is taken, right? So if it's plus one, then we have this probability and this likelihood, and when it's minus one, we have this likelihood, okay? And why, where is that n? That's one half because that's the number of configurations. And if you like, you can think of epsilon as an inverse temperature, but really, all it is is parameterizing a probability in a certain way, okay? That's all it is, right? I mean, a probability on a variable that only takes values plus or minus one is just two numbers, right? And the numbers have to add up to one. So <laughs> that, that's all there is. You can parameterize it any way you want, okay? But it's just two numbers that add up to one, right? Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this exponential, which always takes this form, right? E exponential of minus epsilon times some number. I'm going to write it as one minus one minus exponential, okay? Yes? 
and that we write as 1 plus delta ij and delta ij is this this whole thing after this first one so delta ij is minus 1 minus e to the minus epsilon vij okay and what's the motivation for writing it like this imagine epsilon was very small right if epsilon was very small e to the minus epsilon vij is pretty close to 1 right so it's going to look like roughly 1 minus epsilon vij so we have 1 minus 1 minus epsilon vij so this whole term as epsilon is very small is going to behave like epsilon times vij okay then why do we write it as plus delta ij just so that when we expand it out we don't have to worry about minus signs all the time okay we only plug in the value of delta ij at the very end okay yes so this writing it like this now you see that I, I didn't do any approximation at all right I just rewrote the sum over configurations as sum over configurations times this product 1 plus delta ij right no approximations whatsoever right now okay and now we can expand this product right again it's just algebra we certainly we have a polynomial a multinomial polynomial whatever we can certainly multiply it out right if, you, if it's up to like one or two term even I can multiply it out so you know you guys are young you can do more algebra um, so this is a sum right you can do this okay um, and so we take the one out and we get z is one plus and then there's one over n sum over configurations first the linear terms in delta ij there they are and then there's quadratic terms in delta ij there they are and this goes on right yes this is called the Meyer cluster expansion uh, sometimes it's called the strong coupling expansion that's typically in particle physics or lattice gauge theory it's called the strong coupling expansion in um, uh, statistical physics is usually called the high temperature expansion because epsilon is uh, 1 over the temperature therefore when temperature is large epsilon is small right but we're not really doing statistical physics we're just taking this sum over probabilities and expanding it in different ways okay yes everyone care about this okay okay so now as we we're going to do this very very carefully for a single spin single spin taking values plus minus one the partition function is z one half e to the minus epsilon w plus exponential minus epsilon times minus w this is the term coming from epsilon, from sigma equals plus one this is the term coming from sigma equals minus one and when we write it in terms of these delta variables we introduced it's going to look like z equals one half one plus delta plus plus one plus delta minus and then we can expand it out and we get one plus a half delta plus plus delta minus and there's a delta plus plus delta plus times delta minus square right the quadratic term also okay so this should be an approximate sign um, for epsilon small if we wanted to oh I did write the delta plus here but uh, delta plus delta minus squared term I did write it here uh, for epsilon small we can expand this and we get z is 1 minus epsilon over 2 w minus w oops that's 0 right plus epsilon squared over 4 w squared plus minus w squared so we end up with 1 plus epsilon squared over 2 w squared plus dot 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 but everything onward is higher order in epsilon yes we cool with this okay now the take home message basically here is that z in this high temperature or small epsilon limit is quite trivial to calculate okay that's all there is to it 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Just to belabor this point, I'm going to do two interacting spins now. Then we'll do three, four, one at a time. Okay. But okay, let's do two interacting spins. So now the number of configurations is four, right? Two spins, each taking values plus minus one. Four configurations, and uh, we can have. Uh, three different non-trivial interactions, so to say, observables that we might put in. Sigma 1 and sigma 2, that's two of them there. And the product, sigma 1 times sigma 2. Okay? Right? So Z looks like this. And we can be more uh, organized about this expansion. And we can write E to the W sigma in terms of cosh W sigma plus cinch W sigma, right? I didn't do any approximation. This is just algebra, right? Okay. But now notice cosh is a even function, right? So whether sigma was plus one or minus one, cosh is just going to be cosh independent of W, independent of sigma, right? Yes? Similarly, the cinch W sigma is an odd function, right? So I can drag that sigma out of the cinch W sigma. And so I get cosh W plus sigma times cinch W, right? I know, they, you must be thinking he's gone nuts, he's going so slowly, what is he doing? But, you know, just, just, Bear with me right now, and I want to be sure everyone understands what we did here, okay? So now we factor out cosh w, and we get 1 plus sigma tan w. We all agree with this? Yes? Okay, good. So now the cosh terms don't depend on sigma at all, so they can come out of this partition sum, right? Every term has a a cosh term, right? So we get it out for every variable w1, w2, w3, there is a cosh term that comes from it. Okay? Yes, please. Sorry? Ah, there's w1 sigma 1 plus w2 sigma 2. I use the Einstein summation convention. So when I write wi sigma i, I mean w1 sigma 1 plus w2 sigma 2. This one? It's a new variable. It's a new, it's a separate parameter, W3. It's not W cube. Sorry, bad notation. It's not W cube. It's W, W, a separate new W parameter for sigma 1, sigma 2. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry. Yes. Okay? Yeah, yeah it's not, not a higher power. No. It's a totally separate parameter, W. Okay? So there's three parameters, W1, W2, and W3. Okay? Yes? Okay, so I just applied this to each exponential separately, right? So I write the, this exponential, which has a sum as product of three exponentials, right? And then each exponential I write in terms of this cosh times one plus sigma tanj. And so I get this expansion. Right? Yes? And you notice here that this part does not depend on the configurations at all, right? It's just this part that depends on the configurations. So we won't ever need to sum over these, but it's good to see that what's the only term that could survive here? Remember, sigma 1 independently take values plus or minus 1. So any term that has only one sigma one or one sigma two, right? It's going to be multiplying something that's independent of sigma one. And sigma one is going to take values plus one minus one, right? So all those terms cancel. Any term with only one sigma two 
is also going to cancel. Any term with sigma 1 and sigma 2 is also going to cancel. Okay? Right? So even with interacting spins, z is very simple to calculate. Okay? Okay, so now we go back to lecture one. And I showed you that the kullback leibler divergence between the observed frequency distribution and the uh, probability distribution that we're trying to figure out, the parameters we're trying to figure out, is the expectation value minus the empirical expectation value of that observable, right? We did this way back when, okay. And we said that this expectation value was the derivative of the log of the partition function and that's why it was difficult to calculate because the partition function is difficult to calculate. So was I lying then or am I lying now? I just showed you partition function is very easy to calculate in the high temperature limit. So what's going on? Some in the case that you calculate over infinite number of configuration, it's difficult, but here you saw for two spins of this. Oh, no, 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 no. no? Even, even, even um, if I had an infinite number of spins in the high temperature limit, yeah. that whole configuration sum is going to become one in the high temperature limit. Um, so I was not lying then. This is the whole partition sum for not just high temperature, it's the partition sum for any temperature, okay? That is very hard to calculate. Now I want to find these parameters, theta i or w i, but we have no idea of the magnitude of the interactions of the spin. So what do I mean by going to a high temperature expansion? I have no idea what W is. How can I talk about high temperature, right? So this is where we use our um, favorite new trick, tilting the measure. So let me be very concrete about what we're doing here. Okay, so we have interactions, call them OI. Uh, we have some set of random variables, which are spins, which take values plus minus one, N of these spins and their interactions, in other words, the observables that determine their, uh, you know, the probability of observing a certain configuration, etc., are just given by these operators, these spin products, sigma i, sigma i, sigma j for i less than j, and you can have cubes and, you know, quartic pieces and as many higher dimension things as you want, okay? There is one parameter for each of these observables. And so using the Einstein summation convention, I write it as E to the WI OI, and OI depends on the value of sigma. So the probability of observing a specific configuration given the parameters WI is going to be parameterized like so, right? We have seen this before. E to the WI OI, OI is a function of sigma, and the all important normalization of the probability is the partition function right there, right? Yes, we have seen this. Okay, and if we want to maximize the maximum likelihood, um, what we get is some W star where um, the, the solution is the probability of observing sigma, the observed configurations at W star, which is the frequency of the observed configurations, right? This was from lecture one, okay? And that frequency is just, of course, the number of observations of that configuration divided by the total number of observations, okay? Where's the temperature? Okay, so the basic idea here is going to be that we're going to gradually, if this was, imagine there's some sort of potential in which these spins are interacting. So the idea here is that this is the actual potential and what we're going to do is we're going to flatten this potential, okay? And the whole trick is how do you flatten the potential? 
while maintaining the solution of the maximum likelihood equations that the observable frequencies are equal to the probabilities that the measure that we're determining, okay? So we have to maintain F observable equals P observed, okay? But try to make P easy to calculate, okay? Yes? Okay. Now, again, repeating, if we have the kullback library divergence, these are the observed frequencies, there's the probability, that's the form. Gradient descent tells us that we should uh, change uh, WI, the parameters that we're trying to determine, with some learning rate times the expectation in the empirical distribution of the value of this observable minus the expectation in the theoretical distribution, okay? And whether it's F or Q, the value of this expectation is the sum over all configurations times Q of sigma times OI at that configuration. And why can I write all configurations even for the empirical distribution? Because for the empirical distribution, Q of sigma is zero, except at the observed values, right? Okay. All right. In the small epsilon limit, I showed you explicitly for the two spin case and the one spin case, the only thing that matters is that cosh product of coshes in the beginning, okay? And so at, if I multiply the whole, you know, probability thing by epsilon wi, the expansion of the partition function is one plus epsilon squared over two times the sum over all the wi's just squared, okay? So in this limit, if I define P epsilon of sigma to be this form right here, then the expectation value of OI is just epsilon times WI. That's it. Okay? And what did I do here? There's P of sigma that we had before, right? I multiplied it by P of sigma raised to the power epsilon minus one. Okay? So doing the algebra, this is saying P of sigma raised to the power epsilon, right? And this in the denominator is just normalizing it, okay? The denominator is just normalizing because P of sigma raised to the power epsilon is no longer normalized, right? If the original sum of P of sigma was normalized, if I go and raise it to some power epsilon, it's no longer normalized, right? So we have to make sure it's normalized, otherwise none of this makes any sense, okay? So P epsilon of sigma is not just taking P and raising it to some power, you also have to alter the normalization. Right? So with this denominator, it is still normalized. Okay? Good? So how is this useful? After all, we want to ensure that F observable is equal to P observable. We don't want to find solve a different equation. We want to solve that same maximum likelihood equation. Well, actually, all we want is that the solution of the equation we solve should be exactly the same as the solution of the maximum likelihood. Right? So we're also going to redefine the, the empirical frequencies, okay? In exactly the same way as we modified the theoretical frequencies. Multiply them by P observable raised to the power epsilon minus one. And I have no idea why there's another parenthesis there. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying, yes? Okay? And we also have to normalize the observations, right? Just the way we normalize the P epsilon, right? Okay, now if we try minimizing the kullback libeler divergence between this normalized probability distribution and this normalized probability distribution, it still gives you the answer that you want. 
If you follow the steps that we did, remember there's a Lagrange multiplier that enforces normalization, right? Just follow the steps, step by step, you get the same answer, okay? So what was the benefit? The benefit is now that gradient descent is saying delta Wi is proportional to the empirical frequency, empirical expectation minus the expectation in that high temperature limit. In other words, it's just the empirical expectation in this distorted distribution minus epsilon Wi. That's all there is to it. No partition function, or rather we calculated the partition function. The expectation just happens to be now just minus epsilon Wi. Okay? When Professor Joe and I and uh, uh, our friend Ty first did this, we were really wondering, is this actually going to work? So, why is this useful? Well, first of all, if I said epsilon equal to 1, then it says that Wi is equal to the expectation value in the empirical distribution of the observable. That is called the Hopfield solution. Okay? John Hopfield said that that's the way you determine parameters in an uh, interacting set of spins. It's his idea of associative memory and Hebbian learning. The Wi are equal to the expectation, um, empirical expectation of these observables, Oi. Okay? If we think in terms of a differential equation, right, for epsilon not equal to 1, then what this is is saying it's like a damping term, right? It's like a regularization. Okay? So epsilon equals 1 in some sense is a over damped, right? It just stops right there. Okay? Yes? All right. Okay. Does this work? Well, I wouldn't really be talking about it if it didn't work, right? So um, let's try different values of epsilon. Um, this is the mean squared error. This is synthetic data. That's why I can talk about mean squared error. In real data, you never get to talk about mean squared error. Um, epsilon equals 0, 1.1 doesn't actually get the right um, <coughs> values. Epsilon equals 0 0.8, again, does not get to as low uh, error as you could. Epsilon equals 0 0.5, you know. It's lower than both, so somewhere there's an optimal value. And um, if you plot, uh, this was with respect to iterations, how many iterations it takes to get to the optimal value. And if you look at the mean square error as a function of epsilon, you can see that it goes down and then it starts to go up again. Whether you have 10,000 data points or 5,000 data points, that's how it looks. Okay? Yes? This is for m equals 20 spins. Um, oh, those curves were already on the um, last uh, slide. The kullback leibler divergence looks like so. Okay. Uh, remember, this is the epsilon equals 0 0.8. This is the epsilon equals 0 0.5. And this is epsilon equals 0 0.1. Kullback Leibler as a function of epsilon keeps going down, but we don't really care. What's interesting for us, and what took us a long time to figure out, is exactly when do we stop the iteration, and what is the best value of epsilon to use? Because this is an iterative solution, right? So what value of epsilon should we use, and how many iterations to do, okay? It turns out the number of iterations is not that hard to figure out, but the value of epsilon to use is hard to figure out. So then what we figured out is that if you look at the internal energy, so to say, right, 
that internal energy is maximized at the value of epsilon that gives you the best fit. Okay? It's a very pretty flat curve, so it's not very sensitive, okay? But at epsilon too small, that would be an underdamped system, right? Or epsilon very large, that's an overdamped system, right? Um, that gets you worse um, performance, but somewhere in the range in the middle, if you just follow the energy, and I say, why follow the energy? Because that's actually something that you can calculate from data, okay? You don't need to know what the right answer is, okay? All right. Uh, what's nice about this is that it is very efficient, okay? Um, and it can go to very large system sizes relative to any other way that I know, okay? So this is a pseudo likelihood estimation, that's maximum likelihood. You can use maximum likelihood, exact maximum likelihood, oh, up to about 20 spins, okay? Maybe if you go to a cluster, you can do uh, a few more spins, but not that much more, okay? Because you have to calculate the partition function to do exact maximum likelihood, okay? The pseudo likelihood method is basically doing a Monte Carlo to figure out what the denominator is that we didn't want to calculate, okay? Um, our method, the, which we call the erasure machine, erasure machine, why do we call it erasure machine? Because basically it works by erasing the potential, right? We're distorting it to the point where it's a flat potential, almost flat potential, right? And in the process of that distortion, you can figure out what, you, you see, look at it this way. You have to know what the, um, what the interactions were before you can erase them, right? So in the process of erasing the interactions, we learn what they were, okay? Um, so a few more slides. Uh, weak coupling, strong coupling, sample size, all works pretty well. Um, now I can't show you, so this is for M equals 40, which you can, you know, you can do, uh, you can't really use exact uh, maximum likelihood for this, but you can do pseudo likelihood. Um, and if you look at the accuracy, if you have weak coupling, um, we do pretty well on most things. At strong coupling, we do very well, okay? That's now at, you know, 100 interacting spins. Uh, the Hopfield solution still works because that's a very simple solution, right? WI equals expectation value. The Hopfield solution always works even for very large systems, uh, but not very well. Okay? The other two methods you can't even apply for very large systems. This is 100 spins. Um, the Hopfield solution works, but it doesn't give you the actual couplings. Our solution gives pretty uh, decent couplings relative to that. But just think, what's the state space, what's the set of configurations for 100 spins? Two raised to the power 100, right? You're not sampling this exactly. And no matter how large a data set you get, right? I mean, this is going up to 40,000 samples of 100 spins, right? You're never going to reach 2 raised to the power 100, right? So this is with a very small fraction of the total configuration space, which is all you can hope to get at, okay? And because I work in biology, it is important for me to be able to get some estimate of couplings in very complex systems where there is just not enough data, okay? Okay, um, and that's the last slide, really. Hopfield, Boltzmann, 
and our erasure machine. This is the inferred interactions. These are the actual interactions. Uh, this is for 100 spins. The red is our interactions. The black is what the Hopfield machine gets. Um, computation time, there's the Boltzmann exact calculation. And there's our uh, erasure machine. Uh, I think that's what, at system size 24, that's as high as Ty could get it. Uh, that's a factor of on the order of 10 to the 4 difference. Okay? Um, this is uh, not really well, but okay. So I'll end with uh, what every data science talk has to either start with or end with MNIST images. What we did was we asked, can we figure out, uh, use this kind of Boltzmann machine to remove noise from uh, noisy images if we have some training set, right? So what, how do we use that? The idea is that each pixel represents a spin, right? And the, every, like if you have the digit eight, then you train the WIJ to know what the interaction should be for the digit eight, right? Now if I give it a distorted image with noise, right? The question is, by flipping spins, can we figure out what the correct uh, pixel value should be, okay, for that digit? That's denoising, if you like, using a Boltzmann machine, okay? And so it does reasonably well. It doesn't do perfectly, but it does reasonably well in recovering a denoised image, okay? So thank you for your attention. Hopefully this was amazing. If you have any questions, you know, talk to me or you can email me and I will respond, okay? Right, thank you. Questions? So if, I, if, I if I understood your procedure right, and maybe I didn't, um, you're reweighting all the configurations using this epsilon to make them almost everything you observe almost equal frequency effectively? Is that? Uh, that's right, yes. Can, can you, I, I guess I missed the intuition of why you're not killed by sampling noise on these rare configurations. If I reweight the observed frequencies, <laughs> you would expect much more noise on the tails. And by reweighing it, I thought you would be killed by that noise because you're kind of boosting errors as well as signal. But somehow it doesn't seem to be the case in your empirics. So I, I, I missed no, something because, fundamental. Because actually the, the configuration that you're matching to, right? The, the model configuration is exact. That minus epsilon w that is replacing the uh, theoretical observation expectation value, okay? That is absolutely exact in that limit. And what is happening is that we update w and before the next iteration, the observed frequencies are adjusted to the new W, okay? Let me, um, this is a, a little bit subtle, so let me. Yeah, um, so you see this, right? Okay, so you see this P of sigma, so that's P of sigma as it should be. Um, if you look at this P of sigma, P of observable, okay? This is from the previous iteration. 
So when we do the maximum likelihood, the only variation in p is coming from the log p term, the f log p. The f epsilon is not being changed. So it's just the p term in the maximum likelihood that is being changed. At the next iteration, before we change, before we update, we change the f with the new value of p. Okay? So at every step, it is getting flattened, but it knows exactly how much it's been flattened. Okay? And the partition function is being calculated precisely. Okay? So it's like important sampling, if you like, but the, the tails of the distribution are very sensitive because the, the partition function, the theoretical model uh, part of the uh, gradient, right, is exact. It, I mean, I, we even use this, I didn't, we didn't publish this yet, but we even use this to estimate the partition function using basically this idea and seeing if you follow this through, then actually it gives you an estimate for the partition function. Okay? And even the naivest one, it has some missing in the rare events. Okay? But the majority, it comes pretty close to the exact partition function. So what we're doing is working on improving the tail estimates. Okay? But you do not get killed by the variance, not, not at least in any experiment that we've done. It's simply because it's very, very strongly bound by, see that when you look at this term, right, that is actually a very strong constraint on what model it's trying to fit. You can't, you can't, this, there, there, if you, maybe, maybe this will uh, help a little. If I were to add higher order epsilon terms, this gets much worse. Okay? So it's really this very strict thing that's only true in the extreme epsilon goes to zero limit. So if I add more diagrams, this is actually good. It gets worse, guaranteed. Even epsilon squared will get worse. Okay? So it's very, very strongly determined by this part. Okay, good question. Yes? I also have a question related to this equation. Yes. So with this equation and in the equation above, epsilon appear to be just a scaling parameter and the smaller parameter so that you can expand the partition function using this high temperature expansion. But in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that you need to file Q, so a deformed transformation in such a way that you minimize the variance. So this is a correct... Oh, uh, okay, okay, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. That was just to motivate how you can use sort of uh, different uh, probability densities to get at what you're trying to get at, okay? This is not quite important sampling. It's because what is the Q in this case? What I'm doing is I'm basically taking the... Uh, I'm telling you what P divided by Q, what the new Q is, I'm telling you that it is this very strongly determined strong coupling limit, okay? And then I'm asking, okay, what should P be, what, what, right? I'm distorting in a very, very specific way, in a very rigid way. But does this mean that the uh, F of epsilon is um, playing the role of Q in this case? Because if we iterate uh, to get the F epsilon close to the true... That, that, that's, that's, it's, it's actually, it's P that, that you're trying to determine in this case, right? In that, in that case, you have, in the, in the important sampling case, you don't know what P is, right? Here we don't know what P is, but every, at every step of the iteration, you have a guess for what P is, right? So you distort the F, which is a known distribution, right, with this hypothetical P distribution, 
right? And then you update the p distribution, right? And match it to this f times p epsilon minus one, okay? Right? So you're distorting sort of both. So it's not exactly important sampling. It, it is kind of a, it's just, how should I say? It's an imaginative way to use okay, important so sampling. Okay, that you distort both of them in such a way that you keep the observation consistent. Keeping, exactly, yes. This, this, okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Maybe the time is uh, actually right time to uh, stop here and then let's uh, thank uh, people again uh, for his nice talk. <laughs>